Well, thank you very much, Steve. Indeed, I remember the two of us having lunch back in 1996 or 1997 at the LSE. That's the first time we met. Uh, that's already, what, 16 years or 17 years? It's a long time. Uh, doesn't make me any younger. Um, it's a real treat. It's a real treat well, to be here. I'm really happy at least for two reasons. The first one is I have a day job, which is to be chair of my department, to do research on American cities, French cities, and all of that, teaching, and etc. And I also have a night job. And the night job is to hang around with policymakers and actually work in Colombia. So my night job is the Colombian economy and Colombian cities. And I think it's really fitting that I should be speaking for an evening here, talking about my night job, because usually I'm talking about what I do during my day job during the day. The other thing which is sort of interesting, and there's a bit of irony into that, is my better half, i.e. my wife, uh, was had an offer to come and study development here many, many years ago, back in whatever, 1995. Uh, she was hesitating between coming here or going to study in London. Eventually, she decided to go in London where we met. So, <laughs> <laughs> such is life, so there's a bit of irony here. Okay, so let me tell you about what I've done in Colombia for the last two years. So this is a brief outline well, of my talk. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the country of Colombia, this, uh, well, the mission I was part of, the framework that we used, uh, a set of results that I've obtained so far. And at the end of the talk, I want to talk more broadly about what sort of urban research we want to do in developing countries, what sort of urban research is actually feasible in developing countries, and also talk about the broader issue of academics and policymakers, particularly so in a development context. So Colombia is an interesting country. In many respects, Colombia is a normal country. It's a bigish country at the northern tip of South America. It's about one million square kilometers. Uh, that's about France, Germany, and Italy will put together. So that's a reasonably big country. Far from being as big, of course, as Brazil or China or India, of course. Population is 47 million. So again, much smaller than the big ones, but much bigger than the small ones. It's about as populated as Spain. GDP per capita is, will give or take about $8,000 per person. So in terms of developing countries, it's clearly not as rich as South Korea to the extent that South Korea is still a developing country. Maybe it's a developed country these days. But it's also much richer than, it's also much richer than, well, than China. It's much richer than African countries. It's reasonably high up in the South American League, also significantly below Chile. It's a country that's already pretty highly urbanized, so the urbanization rate is about 75%. Also, uh, our mission says that the urbanization rate is yet to grow even further. If you're interested in cities, that's, that's a good place to go because it has a balanced urban system with something like 50 plus well, cities or metropolitan areas with population above 100,000. So actually, if we look at the map of Colombia, First, what you may notice is that this part of the country in the southwest is completely empty. It's normal, this is jungle, so nobody lives there. It's, so you have all Brazil around here. Uh, and all the cities are concentrated here. So you have lots of cities on the coast, on the Caribbean coast, with Barranquilla, which is the third or fourth biggest well city, Santa Marta, Cartagena. Uh, you also have well cities here in the central well plateaus with Bogota and the big metropolitan region around Bogota. You have another well plateau here with Medellin. And here you have well Cali and the Pacific coast. So it's a, it's a country with well, 50 or so with cities of a reasonable size. If you want to go smaller, well, you find even more, which is nice when you want to run a regression. Lots of Latin American countries like Argentina, there's basically one place, right? Well, two. But uh, it's, it's going to be really hard to run a regression. At least on Colombia, the good news is that I'll be running regressions. Colombia is specific in two ways. Most developing countries have a hard geography. 
Colombia has a particularly difficult geography. So it has mountains everywhere. Uh, this is the end of the, well, of the Andes, so it's dividing well into, into three. So places are historically very separated. There's high up well plateaus, very low, very low well altitude well cities with a very well different sort of climate, a very different sort of culture. So that makes for a very interesting country, but it's highly diverse and the mountains are really, really important. It's also a country that has a difficult past. So clearly among well developing countries, that's not the only one, but it's a country which has been marred by civil unrest for about 80 years. I mean, you, well, you could go even further in time. It's been well violent for a long, long time, but violence on a grand scale, it's the last 80 years. The good news is that the last 10 years have been much better. So it's a country that's actually doing pretty well, and the last 10 years have been much, much better. It's a country that's growing, well, today, 4 to 5% a year. That's very good news. So how did that project start? Actually, it started with the World Bank, which three or four years ago started what they called an urbanization review. They looked at the urban system and cities in seven developing countries. Uh, Vietnam was one of them, Korea was one of them, and Colombia was one of them. So they looked at places with very well different well levels of development, and they produced a little book for each country. The Colombian government actually was quite interested. At the highest level, there was this idea that because Colombia has been preoccupied with its territory only for military purpose over the last 20 years, it was time to turn the page and to move to something else, actually think about the cities, think about the people inside the cities, and not think about well, the territory as how to go there with the army, how to actually well, control with those guerrilla groups, how to protect with the city, but actually think about in terms of development, which is quite important. Also, there's money to, well, to invest for the first time in many, many years. And finally, there's well, Colombian well, public policy is working through cycles, which may not be well, such a bad idea well, for a developing country. So 20 years ago, they made a big effort in terms of education, trying well, to ensure primary well, education and, journalism and, and universal well, coverage. They've been quite successful at that. There's an issue of quality, like in many places, but there's good education. They've tried to go then after for health and, and protection, uh, health insurance, well, for the, well, trying to generalize, well, to, well, well, try to, well, to have that well, for the entire well, population, which is something that is also happening in this country today. But, uh, uh, and now we're reaching the end of that and they're looking for something else. So, and I think these, the upper levels of government are actually pretty open-minded about whether they want to build more roads, whether they actually want to do a more qualitative effort on education or do something else. At the same time, there was also a slightly different context to that, where Colombia is a country which 20 years ago had several waves of reforms coming all more or less at the same time, a new constitution, independent central bank, labor market reform, trade liberalization, all of that happened because at some stage in the early 90s, a new president was elected after the leading well candidate was killed by Pablo Escobar. And the guy came, he, as there was no string attached, he didn't make any promise, and for like nine or 10 months, he had a free reign and he could do more or less what he wanted. So he, did, he had a short window well, of opportunities, he did lots of reform, and one of those reforms was actually pretty drastic with well, decentralization well, of the country, giving lots of power to municipalities. The problem is that it was not fully soaked through, it went really, really fast, and that led to all sorts of problems where municipalities became really well jealous of their budget, and they would not well collaborate with each other, creating all sorts of problems. Recently, they've managed actually to come back on that slightly, and change the way they redistribute intergovernmental grants and trying well, to foster well, some collaboration well, between well, municipalities, which is a way to slightly recentralize well, the country. Not, well, not well, to go back well, to the bad old days, but some amount of probably well, desirable recentralization. The Ministry well, of Planning, he, which is an important ministry in Colombia because with the central bank, this is where the elite goes. This is the ministry that actually sends people here. 
or in other places to study development for a master, for a PhD, and then people will come back and they go back for whatever, four years with the institution, and then they grow and, and work in other ministries. This ministry so decided that it should have a more territorial focus. So it was really interested in that urban mission because it wants to play a part in that, well, in that change role of institution and recentralization of the country. So the, so the project started as a one-year project. After one year, it was very clear that it was not enough, so we are going on for a second year now. At the end of this year, i.e. before Christmas, there will be a document, but this will not be really the end. I think well, the idea is to keep that well open-ended and do actually more research on Colombian cities, keep that going. So it's a wide-ranging studies. We, we, it's being headed by a, f well, a former well, foreign well, minister who was also well ambassador well, in this country. She's a woman of really high caliber, and she assembled a big team well, of consultants with 12 or 13 well, different teams looking at all sorts of aspects of cities, looking at amenities, looking at transportation within cities, looking at transportation between cities, looking at housing, looking at land markets, looking at local labor markets, and so on and so forth. Uh, three or four missions on institutional aspects, et cetera, et cetera. And in that mission, there's a base team, and within that base team, there's one foreign expert, that's me. That's the way. So when I started, my job was not fully defined. I was chosen for all sorts of bizarre reasons, in part because my wife was working in that institution before, in part because I, I got to know them over the years, and also because of sheer well serendipities. There was actually one of the director who came across one of my papers and said, well, I would like to meet that guy. So things happen from time to time. So they, so they told me, okay, we'd like you to come and collaborate. So I was going to come once every two or three months for a couple of years. And, but my job was not fully written, so I defined it myself. In the beginning, I was the guy who was the guardian of the methods. So basically, the consultants we, would come up with some ideas about how to do something, and I would say yes or no. Or I would say, okay, you cannot do that. This is not going to be valid. You, it's better to do it this way, and so on and so forth. The other thing I brought was some international, world, some international world perspective, clearly coming from the countries I've been working on, but also because four or five years ago I was paid by the World Bank to look at the literature, which is something quite nice. Well, from time to time you're being paid well, to read academic papers. Uh, I like it. I, I understand that many people don't, but I do like it. And so I had some ideas of other countries and the small world literature on urbanization in developing countries. We also divided roles, so the head of the mission was the good cop, and because she needed to keep well, everybody on board, and, and, she, and she's a diplomat anyway, uh, I was the bad cop, so whenever well, something unpleasant would have to be said, it usually came from my mouth, and uh, that was it. And also, going forward in the mission, it's a somewhat well, chaotic well, process from time to time, and early on I was saying, look, we need to define metropolitan areas. Colombia has municipalities, but we need to define metropolitan areas. Clearly, the municipality well, of Bogota is only a part of the big metropolitan region. We need to do that. And after more than a year, I was like, we need to do that. It's not happening. And everybody will turn to me and say, OK, we have some data about well, commuting well, between, well, between well, municipalities. Can you please do it? So I spent a couple of nights actually redefining or defining metropolitan areas for Colombia, which was an interesting exercise. But so I did all sorts of odd jobs like that. And at some stage, I said, OK, let's try to be slightly more serious. And also because I grew sometimes a bit unhappy with what the consultants were doing, so I decided to collect data myself. After a year, I managed to put my hand on 60 years, 16 years of a household wealth survey, which would be the equivalent of the US CPS. There's an interesting internal road trade survey where they actually stopped trucks and asked them where they're coming from, where they're going to, what there is in the truck, how much it was, how, and the weight was the truck. So it would be some sort of equivalent to the US commodity flow survey. I have data about the current road network and also past road networks going back to the colonization period. 
and even before actually. I have five to 10 years of assessed property values for all Colombian municipalities, all 1,100 of them. I have extensive well tabulations from two population and two production well censuses at the municipal level. I have a municipal, a local well municipal well government well database which has like a thousand variables in it. So Colombia is an interesting country because they collect lots of data and this is not everything. I have some for 20 or so well cities. I have a breakdown of expenditure by social group. I have some base, very basic well, personal well, transportation data. I have lots of municipal data about the history of those places, the geography of those places, the resources well, that they have, whether or not they have coal, emeralds, God knows what. All of that is in, my, in the data that I managed well, to collect. I have an innovation survey that I didn't have time well, to open yet. And I have some further education data that they sent me. I have no idea what this is. So I'm like, surrounded by data, I'm droning in numbers, what can I do with that? So the way I've been thinking well about it is something that Steve told me the students here were familiar with and the others probably because they probably heard me talk about that over and over again. So this is the way I'm thinking about well cities, at least in developing countries. Uh, well, sorry, at least in rich countries, but also in developing countries. So it's basically four curves. Curve number one is the wage as a function of city size. And the notion is that cities bring productivity benefits, there are agglomeration economies. So the bigger the city, the more efficient. The name of the game is indeed to try to identify this curve or the, and the slope of this curve, i.e. what is the elasticity of wages with respect to population and sometimes slightly more detailed well questions, what is the elasticity of wages in a particular industry with the size of the particular industry in that city. But we also know that cities are not only about benefits, they are also all about costs. As you have more population in a city, land is becoming really scarce. So the price of housing goes up. As a result, people need to go and live further away. So there's more transportation. You spend more time in transportation. Things can be made much, much worse because of congestion. When everybody's taking the road at the same time, this is becoming way more costly for everyone. And maybe also getting goods can become more expensive or less expensive. But the notion is that there are some costs that increase here where, where the access well is inverted as the city is growing. So if I take the difference of this minus that, or depending on how well we measure the ratio of this minus that, I'm getting a net benefit from cities, i.e. benefits minus costs, which under some assumptions might look like this, i.e. there's a happy well city size well over there, which might be somehow well optimal, and you can be too small or you can be too big. Then my city, people will want to go to my city or not. So there will be a supply of population, a labor supply curve for my city, depending on the level of net wage that my city offers. People will come, and if the, if the net wage will goes up, of course, they will want to come in larger numbers. If people are freely mobile, in that case, of course, this labor supply curve will be flat. If they're fully immobile, it will be vertical. What's also interesting here is that depending on the level of amenities, you're going to ask for a net wage which is going to be higher or lower. If a place has really good amenities, you'll be willing to sacrifice some consumption. So in that case, you will face a lower net wage, well, a lower labor will supply curve, or if you have bad amenities, you're going to ask for some compensation, i.e. a higher net wage, and, your, and the labor will supply curve will, will for that city is going to be higher. So this is a very simple framework that allows us well, to think about a number well, of important issues, agglomeration, urban costs in the, in the sense of housing and commuting costs, amenities, labor supply curve, we should do that thinking in terms of migration, but this is way too hard and the data is missing and this is complicated. So the shortcut well, that I'm taking here is that I'm looking at city growth. But that's what this curve is also about. Instead of trying to look at people well, coming in and going out, you just look at the net, uh, including well, the demographics, which is well city growth. One thing which is not fully apparent, but we could enrich well, the framework well, to think also about the growth of particular sectors in cities and lay, and in the background, well, there's also 
with the whole issue of internal trade and market potential for those places. So thinking about agglomeration, I don't want to do well, something which is completely high tech. I think the bound, well, I think well, the, well, the research world frontier has actually moved quite far well, in the recent past. And for that, you need actually pretty sophisticated data, very sophisticated well, sources well, of variation. So here, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to replicate some benchmark studies. One of them is mine, but which are still reasonably simple and manageable with simple, mi with simple well, micro data. So the key regression, what you want to run here, is you want to explain the log wage of this person I as a function of a bunch of characteristics of that person, education, gender, everything well, you can observe well, about well, that person, but also the size of the city this person is living in. And the level of education of the city J this person I is living in. The two claims in the literature is that we have a coefficient here, A, which is well, significant and positive, i.e. when my city grows larger, people become more efficient and get higher wages. Also, when my city becomes more educated, not me, but my city becomes more educated, in that case, I also benefit from that. We talk about human capital externalities. Of course, we also want to control for other characteristics of the cities, uh, all sorts of natural well advantage well explanations, where they are, their geography, and all of that. The key problem with that sort of regression is that you may have, as people get more numerous in cities, they may become more productive. But it may also be the case that it's actually the better workers that move to the larger cities. I.e., there might be some sorting which we might not be able well, to observe. So one way to sort out well, this problem is to try to observe as much as you can. So here I don't have a panel, so I'm limited in what I can do, so, but I can try to use a wide array of individual well, characteristics. The second problem is that my model actually just here is also saying that as my city is becoming more productive, more people should want to come from it. Well, to it, i.e., there's this labor supply curve, there's a labor supply response. As my city is becoming more productive, people will want to go there, which means that in this regression here, well, causation is not running perhaps well from well, population to higher wages, but maybe from higher wages to more population. We might have reverse causation. This one is slightly easier to deal with because we have determinants of city size that go back in time. I have that well for Colombia. So it's not completely foolproof, but this is something reasonable. This is at the level of papers that I've published for, well, for France and papers that Ed Glazer will have published well, for the US. So I think we are, it's not great, but it's sort of okay. The other thing that is interesting here is that you want to, you want to do that also because you don't want to innovate too much. I want to be able to compare my results. I want to be able to compare what's going on in Colombia with what's going on in other countries. I will come back well, to that point where, where later on when we'll in the talk. So, in that, so, so what we find here is an agglomeration elasticity of around 5%, i.e. when my city becomes 10% larger, wages increase by about 0.5%. Well, you can try well, to do all sorts of other things. There's no such thing as non-linearities. I'm getting the same results if I'm looking at municipalities or metropolitan areas and so on and so forth. In terms of comparisons, that's interesting because this 5% number is a bit above what we find for France, for Spain, for the US, for the UK, for Germany, for all the countries all the rich countries where that sort of regression has been run, but we also find much smaller number than China and India, where people tend to find ele well, elasticities of like, well, 10%, if not above. So Colombia is not particularly special, at least for agglomeration externalities. We also find, in terms of human capital externalities, very strong effects i.e. when the share of university educated workers in your city increases by 10%, wages increase by whatever, three, four, five, six percent So this is a very large number. At the same time, we do find that for other countries as well. It seems to be slightly more extreme in Colombia. Turning to urban costs, 
there's not that much literature, so I'm relying on a paper of mine with my French well co-authors, where we do something reasonably simple, which is to regress housing prices on city population, city wages, and other city characteristics. Again, we have some identification issues here. Population and housing prices are going to be determined simultaneously. If a place is really expensive, people will not come to that place. So again, it's not quite clear which direction will causation is running to and from. There's also an interpretation problem is that in order to think about urban costs, I would like to know about transportation, and I don't know very much about internal well, transportation. I know a little bit, but not that much. And I would like to be able to compare the price of land, really, in the same sort of locations. But when you have a city of 10 million people or 8 million people like Bogota, your average piece of land is going to be quite far from the center. So trying to compare apples with apples, so typically with the price of land in the center, is reasonably hard. I don't have that data well, for Colombia, so I can try to mimic what we've done well, for other countries, but that's not easy, that's going to be imperfect. Nonetheless, I'm finding results here which are not super different from those well, that I find well, for France. So the elasticity of housing prices with respect well, to population is about 25%. So it means that if housing prices also reflect higher commuting costs, which they don't seem to well completely well in Colombia, it means that if we devote about 25% of our income, which is the case in Colombia, well, 26% to housing, well, to housing, it means that urban costs, the elasticity well, of urban costs with respect well, to city population is about 6%, which is about the same sort of magnitude as, well, as agglomeration well, benefits. So again, like in France, we have agglomeration benefits and urban costs that sort of offset each other. What's also interesting, I'm getting an elasticity of housing prices with respect to average income of about well, 30%. If you write down well, a simple model, that should be well, the share well, of housing in expenditure. And in the data, it's 26%, and it doesn't trend with city size. So this is reasonably good news. On the, on the amenity side, I've tried, I've tried, and I've tried again, and I never found anything. So my suspicion is that maybe at the level of development of a country like Colombia, people care about wages, they care about urban costs, but maybe amenities are not that important. But, you know, this is a conjecture. Then for urban growth, I wrote a survey with Diego Puga for a forthcoming handbook in, um, in growth. So what we did was to look at the entire well, literature for all countries, and I think we isolated what the key factors or what the key drivers were in the literature. So it's typically wages, the share of educated workers again, climate, geography, roads, industrial, industrial structure, and amenities. The problem in that sort of regression here, where you regress growth over change in local population between to, well, two periods in time, which in my case is going to be 1990 and 2005, well, the date of two, well, of the last two well, censuses well, in Colombia. You're going to regress that as a function of log population well, to take care of possible mean reversal and a bunch of explanatory well, variables, all those things here, wages, share of education, well, of educated well, well, workers within the workforce, climate, etc., etc we might be missing some variables. Like there's lots of things that we think might have, a, might have an effect on urban growth, like local governments and all of the things that people talk well about when policy will discussion over and over again. I cannot well capture that. So I might have an, well, a missing well variable. Also, there might be some simultaneity again between well, population growth and some of its drivers. You know, you might be building roads in anticipation of growth. So in that case, if you regress roads at the beginning of the growth against roads at the beginning of your period, you may still have an endogeneity problem. Well, so what do we find here? We find weak evidence of divergence, i.e. larger cities are becoming, if anything, even larger relative to smaller cities. I think this is due to the growth of Bogota, which is sort of diverging from the other big cities and also to the growth of some mid-sized cities which are sort of taking off. There's the most important driver of urban growth in Colombia is the share of university-educated workers. Again, 
that seems to play a huge role. I can try to run the regression one way or another way, introduce whatever control I want. I'm still getting something really, really solid here. I cannot instrument that. I don't know how to do that. But I'm getting something really, really, really strong association in the data. There's also a strong association with wages, with an elasticity again of about well, 30%. I'm getting stuff about roads, but I don't want to conclude well, well too much well today because I think I need to do more homework on that. And I find absolutely no evidence whatsoever about climate and geography, very much unlike what's happening in this country and European countries. And I'm getting well, some more stuff also. Places with more manufacturing, interestingly, also seem to be growing more, whereas more diverse well, places in terms, of, in terms of production structure seem to be growing less. Let me skip that. What's there? And the last exercise is about trying to see the importance of roads with respect well, to trade. So it's based on a recent one paper of mine with, uh, with Peter Morrow and Matt Turner. And what we do is to try to see to what extent the presence of roads well, locally is going to affect whether or not you export stuff and what you export. The problem is that if you want to do the exercise well properly, We've been, I've been working on roads in America for a long, long time with Matt Turner. And we always try to do this exercise. For, but we, for years, we forgot some really important issue, which is that if, we, well, if I take well, a parallel with countries, if you're a country like New Zealand, you may be really good at exporting. You, know, you may have a strong comparative advantage in some particular goods, uh, meat and dairy products and all those things. And you may be well, potentially really good at exporting. But it's not going to show in the data because there's nobody nearby with whom you can trade. The nearest country is Australia, and it's already like 2,000 miles away. Whereas you may not be particularly good at exporting, let's say with a country like Spain, but you have lots of neighbors to trade with, so in the data you're going to trade a lot. So the first thing you need to do for countries, and in my case for Colombian cities, is first to run a regression that looks like this, where you look at trade flows between a country with a city J and a city M as a function of a fixed effect for the exporter, a fixed effect for the importer, and distance between the two, or some polynomial of distance between the two. So you're going to control for what trade economists call multilateral resistance well to trade, i.e. your ability or your propensity well to trade after correcting well for the fact that you may be far from other traders or close to other traders. So, do, so here, what's interesting is this quantity here, which will be your propensity well, to export after we've controlled for where you are, where the other well, well, trade partners are. So what we do then is to regress this true propensity well, to export on whether or not you have roads in your city, your population, you want to, or at least our model says that you want well, to introduce well, market access or market potential again, and maybe some other well, characteristics. Again, you're afraid that roads might be built in order to accompany your industrial structure. If you export lots of stuff, particularly lots of heavy stuff, the government might be well, providing you with more roads. So again, you want to instrument for that. We, in our paper, we make the case that old roads provided you control for geography and other things are probably a reasonable instrument. So in that case, what we find is two things. The first thing that was somewhat surprising is that the gravity aspect of trade between Colombian cities, the coefficient is pretty low, like minus 0.6. If we look at gravity regressions, the average well coefficient well, that people find is like minus 0.1. For the US, we actually find a coefficient of minus like 1.5. I.e. trade is way more sensitive well, to distance in America than it is in Colombia. I think this finding actually makes perfect sense. Because when trade costs are really, really high, you're only going to trade goods which, well, for which well, the demand is pretty inelastic because trade will be very costly, so they will be much more costly at destination, and that will be worth it only if people are still willing to buy it. On the other hand, when trade costs are pretty low, like they are in America, in that case, you want to trade all sorts of goods, even goods for which well, the demand is very elastic. And in that case, for those goods, small differences in trade costs mean small differences in prices, but big differences in how much people are willing to buy. So it means that actually finding that 
somewhat well paradoxically that trade is more sensitive well, to distance in the US than it is in Colombia, despite very difficult well, geography, may not be that surprising. At least this is my explanation. There might be another one. And then when we look at the effect of roads on trade, I'm finding reasonably big effects, i.e. when you have 10% more roads in a city or when you are 10% closer to the major roads, you export 2% more, both in value and in weight. For the US, we only found some action on the weight of exports. In Colombia, we, we found, i.e., in the US, if you have more roads, you export heavy stuff. You specialize in heavy manufacturing, which we can well corroborate looking at production data. In Colombia, actually, when you have more roads, you don't specialize more, you just export more. Regardless of the sector, I couldn't find any evidence of actually roads leading to specialization. So, this is still work in progress. I still have things to do. I think my two substantive conclusions were so far are that roads are really, really important, and so is education. Education, I, it's particularly so because I feel, or oh, the data say that in Colombia, the elite, 80 plus percent of university educated workers live in four cities. In the entire country, they are well concentrated, 80% of them in four cities. And I think actually if we were to look at more detailed well data, actually well correcting for the quality well of their education, I think it's 100% of the elite that lives in four cities and never goes elsewhere. And I think this is part of the problem for Colombia. But otherwise, I've found lots of things that tell me that Colombia is not a country that is so widely different from more developed world countries in Europe in America and in Asia. So that's, I think that's an interesting thing. What I want to do next is actually to try to integrate all those findings and actually have a model where all those findings would actually be parameters of a model. And the idea is that with that model, you know, that model might be a good one or less good one. I, I mean, time will tell. But that will also allow me to look at some counterfactuals, i.e. what happens to the entire country if we actually do this road building program. I'm not saying that we should base our decisions only on that, certainly not, but that's interesting. Also, what happens if we increase well, the participation in university well-educated uh, well workers? Uh, will if we increase well, their share? Will, uh, so will that lead to those guys actually well concentrating well even more in those four cities? Will that lead well, to some well dispersion? That's the sort of question I would like to be able to answer, but I think well, for that I, need, I will need well, to impose more structure and actually have a model. So more broadly, what sort of research can we do in developing countries? What sort of urban research can we do in developing countries? What the decision I've done here was to do some replications of stuff that has been done before. I think this is very useful for policymakers because you look at the first order sort of stuff. If you want to go at the frontier, chances are you're looking at something that's going to be more narrow and less interesting for those guys. I also think that by actually doing that sort of replication, it's helpful to build a knowledge base for the entire world. I.e., we get we have findings for a set of countries. Now, well, Colombia is one of them. Uh, some people at the World Bank are, are working well on, well on India with Bill Kerr, well at Harvard. I think this is also well very useful. We're getting more numbers more things that we can well compare. And I think we actually learn by looking at differences well across countries. So those regressions are certainly not perfect, but we can at least well compare them well across countries. The problem with that sort of work is, of course, the academic payoff is limited. You don't publish that in Econometrica. That's okay. I think that's okay. You know, I'm also a co-editor of the Journal of Urban Economics, a nice replication to me, is worth way more than something that is trying to be new but not successful. So I'd rather take a nice replication for a country of important regressions rather than some very obscure regression that may be novel in a way but will be problematic. We don't really know what the problems are anyway. I, I like replications, so I think field journals there's, they should be well taking that and, and maybe well taking that way more than they actually do. The other way you can think about 
urban research in developing countries, which is more ambitious, is actually to use the fact that in those countries there are always some idiosyncrasies, there's always some accident of history here or there, or some crazy regulation that was passed at some stage. That's giving you an interesting source of variation that you can use to estimate stuff. And in that case, what you're doing here is really pushing with the frontier, you actually estimate something that we care about in a better way than the others before. I haven't seen that a huge amount for developing countries, but I think there's quite a lot that can be done. Third, I've spoken as if cities in developing countries were like cities in rich countries, but slightly more poor. That's true, but only to some extent. There are also features of developing cities which are specific. First, developing countries, most of them, they have a dual labor market. Even in Bogota, 60% of the workforce is informal. In lots of developing countries, in lots of developing world cities, that can be an even higher number. There's a whole range of issues associated with the existence of a formal and an informal sector in the labor market. We also find a very important real duality in housing. In lots of developing cities, 50 to 60% of the population lives in slums. Historically, it's about half of well, of the population when developing with cities that has been at some point or some other illegal, i.e. did not have well, a title. So all of that is very specific and is calling for specific well, research. That's really important, but it's really for research about well developing well countries that are mainly of interest for those countries. Then there's also a whole set of issues about the fact that there's still some urbanization well going on. So Colombia is at the end of the phase. Korea has reached well, the very end, but lots of countries are still urbanizing and urbanizing pretty fast. So that's raising also all sorts of issues which are interesting in themselves that we need well, to learn about. Again, also we're quite specific well, to developing countries. There's this idea that the biggest city may be favored unfairly by the government for all sorts of reasons. There's some research on that. There certainly well, could be more. So what about the relationship between academia and policymaking in a development well context? So my, this is my own experience. I think it's been a generally nice experience. It's been better than I expected. I was expecting to be able to make no difference whatsoever. I don't think I made a big difference, but at least I think when I came very clearly from the first urbanization review, there was a big issue about roads. And everything we've done afterwards, I is a very good consultant we hired that worked on that, my own work after that. Everything really is telling us that roads matter a huge deal. And this is coming from me, who says that in papers that the US should not build any more road ever. <laughs> well, to caricature, but this is coming from, from somebody who's not like a big road proponent. I've been actually going to transportation meetings and lobbyists were just yelling at me. So, but in Colombia, I think really they need more roads. The main artery of the country is not two lanes everywhere. Actually, it's two lanes on both sides, 50% of the way, no more. So it needs roads, this is usually important. I think this message has gone through. My other key message, I think, is about education. What I've done, everything says loud and clear that there's a huge issue here, and, I'm not, and this is not well, the only work well, that says that. I don't think the, well, the notion of education and cities and education quality at the primary level, maybe at the secondary level, so, well, the distribution of university with educated well, workers well, across cities, all of that I don't think has not well, gone through well properly, in part because it's not fully clear in my mind, maybe. So people have some sort of sense that maybe this matters, but it's not viewed as a priority, whereas I think it should really be a priority. Another thing that I could do was, every time there was something that was really, really stupid, I thought, I could do some damage. I could not, I mean, I could not well completely kill it, and I'm sure it will resurface at some stage, you know, like the bad zombies, they always, like the bad ideas, so always will resurface, but you can do some damage. For instance, I'm not a huge fan of cluster policies. I mean, those who know me know that. Uh, I think doing high-tech well clusters in developing well countries is a completely mad idea. I could do some damage. I'm not sure I completely killed the idea, but at least I could do some damage. What I also found is that 
whenever you have 50% of the economists in a policy meeting, the discussion sometimes become really abstract and we go away from reality. And we start with discussing really obscure issues and the others are just like, they open big eyes and they go like, what are you talking about? And we are no longer relevant. At the same time, when I was the sole economist in a meeting, the discussion always quickly would degenerated into some minutiae of institutions. And they were just talking about that over and over again. You have no idea how many hours I spent listening about some very specific institutional features and the low number blah, blah, blah from this year and article X that was so important. Yes, those things are important, but there's also some economics out there that we need well to consider. So that's been, uh, well, that's been well quite interesting in, in that respect. One thing I discovered, but I think I knew that from, from previous world policy experience, you're not able to put on the table specific, well, specific world policy world proposals. So that's, so that's a limitation. At the same time, you know, policy making is a really, it's been well compared to a sausage making well factory. And you're just a small part of that factory. So, you know, you can try to steer things in one direction or another, but you're certainly not the guy who's producing with the sausage in the end. More generally, I find interacting with policymakers, and I've done that for 15 years, first in the UK, a tiny bit in Canada with the World Bank. I've done that in France, uh, a little bit in the US, a lot in Colombia. I find that it's, for me, it's hugely interesting because it's telling me where the questions are. And one of the reasons why I'm actually for Colombia, we're replicating well papers that I've done before for other countries, is that actually talking well to policymakers in those countries, I realized that this was really important to do those papers in the first place. So hanging out with policymakers, I find that really well educational. And I think it's also good for them. Not that they're going to listen to everything you say, but from time to time they will pay attention. In a developing when the, in a development will, will context, there's also an added benefit where you have multinational organizations like the IMF and the World Bank. The OECD also well these days is, is like is taking well Colombia well as a member, for instance. So that's it's going into well, the development world in a way. Those guys have a lot of leverage. And they will listen to us way more, I hope. Even more broadly, something we need to be aware of as academics is that the policymakers who talk to us, they are not your average policymakers. They tend to be more enlightened. They tend to be more open-minded. So, so the policymakers who speak with academics, they're a selected sample. Like, I was doing that with a slightly more reasonable well country, well, Colombia, with what is perhaps the most technically well sophisticated well ministry. I was not going to the Ministry of Social Affairs in Venezuela. Those guys, they don't want to talk to me, I'm pretty sure. And they don't want to talk to any of us. They have ideas. <laughs> to make the experience well, well successful, I discovered that it's really important to manage each other's expectations. The economies going out in the real world will like, okay, I'm going to sort them out and I'm going to draw a grand plan and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. As I told you, this is not happening. At the same time, there's also this expectation from policymakers that we can answer all their questions, especially all their day-to-day -day questions. And very often you have like, I have no idea. But what we can do is to say, okay, let's step back and try to think about those issues from first principles. And usually they are sort of, they're discovering something. They're quite happy with about that. So they don't have an answer to their precise questions, but they've learned something. And I think what they've learned was something interesting and they find it important. What we also need to be aware of as academics dealing with policymakers is that Policy making is sometimes a moving target. The discussion will go here and then we'll go there and then we'll jump here and so on and so forth. And to be serious, we need to readjust with the conversation for, well, from time to time. So it means saying, look, 
we cannot we've been talking about that for way too long or this is not the issue we need well to steer back and actually look at or think about that again the other thing that we need to be aware of is that on both sides the way we persuade each other the way we talk the way we think is very different academics will be investing a huge amount of time to think only about one issue to try to estimate only one number in policy making, they will typically will consider a much broader range of things without that much depth. And trying to talk to each other also means that we need to be well aware well of that on both sides. So to end up, uh, I've been reasonably happy in my, in my experiences with policy makers. Uh, so I think that academics actually would gain, uh, personally I've gained a lot engaging with policy makers. Uh, not all academics will, should be well doing that, well, for sure. You don't want to do that when you're too young because you're not going to be rewarded for it. Like my colleagues look at me and say, why are you doing that? Well, I'm doing better research. And, and sometimes my research, I feel, may not be fully useful to the world, whereas actually going out and trying to help people sort out things might be more useful. So you don't want, I don't want to do only that, but I think it's part of my job to do that. And for policymakers, I think they should draw more on academia, but they need to be educated on what they can expect from us. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. That was great. Thank you so much, Gilles. So we have some time for uh, questions, and I'm sure that uh, many in the audience, whether uh, Academics trying to figure out whether this is a, something they'd like to get into, or students who are uh, have, have come here from a policy world and are now in an academic world might like to quiz you about this. So, sure. Um, oh. uh, I see several hands up. Let's start uh, here. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Watme. I'm a CDE class of 2013. I come from Lebanon. I have a tax background. So the first question that I had related to the challenges uh, that you faced when you were creating municipalities. We know that uh, in Colombia we have a lot of seasonal workers uh, involved in the coffee industry. So I can imagine that uh, municipalities were, were struggling uh, uh, or for example, when you were defining which municipality would be, uh, which municipality would have more tax income, uh, which municipality would have the more uh, the more coffee fields or the more industrial work and to have more income. So, I would just like to know what are the challenges, and I have another uh, question which is related to the roads. Uh, as a Lebanese, I know. We all heard about the Phoenicians, how they were involved in trade all over the seas. So because they have uh, the, the certain technology for the ships, and this is how they were involved with the, with the trade. So I can imagine for Colombia that the roads uh, were very important in defining the trade patterns, but also were very important in defining the matching, because we, you just said that certain levels of people, uh, more academics, more professional people maybe, people who were earning more were coming to certain cities. So those people were, were finding their matches in those cities and maybe roads were helping those people get to those cities and also were helping seasonal workers get to the cities where they can get, uh, or, or the, the small towns where they were getting better work or they were able to move around more freely. Thank you. Okay, these are not easy questions. This is the sort of question that policymakers ask you, and I never know how to answer. I never know how well, well how to answer them. So, whether roads bring in people is a really hard question. I think I know that roads are a driver of urban growth. So I have a paper with Matt Turner which says that it's driver with urban growth for the US. It's a driver, I think, of urban growth for Colombia. Then what is the exact mechanism through which those things are working? It's, it's a really hard question. Roads, yes, they allow people to come in or go out. 
they can also go out. Some models say that the relationship here is going to be ambiguous. But it also allows stuff to come in and go out. And it could be that indeed roads allow people to come in and then they produce stuff, or that the place is really good at producing stuff and people come in even though they would have come in without the roads. And trying to identify that is a really hard problem. I wish I could do that. I don't know how to do it. So here we are entering the really hard questions. I decided well to start with reasonably aggregate relationships. But yes, the road ahead is also to try to disentangle between well, different types of mechanisms. So I, I can see well in the data that roads are a factor well, of growth well, for cities. In the US, it could also be the case, and maybe well, in Colombia, if you have more roads in your city, that may also allow people to commute further away and actually to accommodate well, the growth well, of cities without having too many well, traffic jams and, uh, and allow well, people well, to consume land, have a nice... We don't know what the mechanism is. I wish I, I, wish I knew that. I think it's a really, inter really interesting well, direction well, for research. I don't know where to go from there. I mean. Hopefully, well, someone brighter well, than me one day will figure it out. Uh, but this is, yeah, we start, my, my philosophy here is to start from the more aggregate relationships and step by step well, to try first well, to measure what the big elasticities are, try to make sure as much as I can that those elasticities are causal, and then indeed try to establish some particular mechanisms. But the established particular well, mechanisms part is the hardest part in economics. Did I answer your question or not answer your question? Yeah. The, other question? the other question related to the challenges that you faced when you were defining municipalities. You said that you helped in the beginning when you were defining municipalities. I, I just want to know, because I think there be tax challenges or service fee challenges, certain municipalities was, would want this territory to be under their uh, their management or something else that because this part of the country would be more profitable. So I just want to know, by curiosity, what were the challenges that you faced in that domain? Thank you. So here there's a broader issue. I mean, that's one of the issues. So what we've done with that mission was to go several times. I've tried to avoid that as much as, I mean, that was interesting to do it a few times, but I think they went, the, well, the mission officially went to 16 well, different cities. Speaking with local well, stakeholders, policy makers, uh, entrepreneurs and everything, uh, myers, et cetera, and having an interaction with those guys. I think it was really important well, to do that. So I went to a couple of those things. And yes, you have discussions, and very often, so it's one of the discussions because everything that's touching on local public finance is really, really important, and people care a huge amount about that. So yes, I've heard well, stories about, oh, but well, the, well, the current well, well, transfer well, system is unfair for us because we actually have way more people than the census is registering because the census was done at this time of the year, and indeed we have this transient population, or since the last well, census, we've actually had displaced with population because, well, Colombia still to this day has more displaced with population than the former well, Yugoslavia at the peak of the crisis. So it means that you have several million people in Colombia who have been well displaced, and some of them have been well displaced since the last census in 2005. So those guys are complaining that the system is unfair to them. So you listen to them. At the same time, me as the data person, it's, it's a really hard set of issues to deal with because we just don't, we don't, we just don't have well, the, well, the data well, to document that well, properly. So unless well, Colombia does another census or finds a way to get... So Colombia, for a developing world country, has great data, but in order actually to be able to deal with those problems and to know really what the reality is, you would need much, much better well, data, and that's one of the challenges. So I'm also trying to get, indeed, well, Colombian stats will to improve, and you know, you're doing this survey this way, I would, I would prefer it will to be that way. Like, Colombia has no big transportation data at the individual level. It's looking at trade flows on the, uh, on the major roads. It's not looking at the transportation behavior well, of people. In this country, there's a survey every six or seven years which is asking 50,000 people about what they've done over the last three days. Where did you go? What time did you start? Where did you go? How many kilometers? And so on and so forth. For a three-day well period, will they keep a little well diary about what, well, about what they do in terms of transportation? For Colombia, 
Bogota is doing something kind of like this. Medellin is doing something way less well sophisticated. A couple of other cities, and then that's basically it. We have no idea how people move around in their everyday life, how they do well their errands in Colombia. I have no idea. I would like to know about that. I would like to know how far they go, how far they go. I would like to be able to measure what the cost of congestions. I cannot do that. Uh, I think you can hear me without the microphone. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, my questions are like three theoretical questions rather than practical one. So first one is like uh, in your presentation that you have shown us that the labor supply curve is convex. Uh, as, a, uh, as a student of economics of CDE, uh, we have learned that uh, normally labor supply curve is concave or a linear, linear, uh, linear curve. But here you have uh, you have shown us that is the convex curve. <clears throat> Just uh, that's one one of my questions. Why it is convex rather than yes, and uh, the, in the second curve. And the second question is like you have asked uh, you have shown us about g uh, gravity model. So from Krugman we have we have we have uh, known that uh, like uh, geog geographical proximity will help us to have more trade but you had a negative coefficient rather than ha having a positive coefficient. So my question is that why you were like, uh, it's a negative finding from the Krugman theory. And the last question is that a developing country moving from agricultural to industrial country, maybe it's, it's uh, like also true for Colombia, but uh, can you uh, shed some light on that? Like uh, urbaniz urbanization with this rapid uh, growth does it have any trade-off between uh, agricultural to industrial? Or what is the percentage of GDP that is coming from agriculture and in, uh, industry from Colombia? Thank you. OK. Uh, I mean, here, this is mostly for the purpose of, well, of illustration. That curve can be, I mean, well, the name of the game is to try to estimate it. I think there's a good argument why you should have well, this shape. The idea is that as the wage goes up, it's becoming harder and harder well, to attract well, people. Because people, when uh, you know, they're not coming well, to your city, you offer them 10% well, more. If they're not welcoming, it's because they don't really like well, your place. But I'm not whether well, to that well, particular shape. This is really to have a nice graph more than anything else. I think what we, what we try well, to estimate here is really well, the, well, well, the slope. So the first effort I've done was to try to get well, to estimate an average slope, i.e., well, well, implicitly, well, it's all log linear anyway. Uh, again, I'd like to be able well, to go deeper, but this was mostly for illustration. For gravity, you know, I think it's entirely well consistent with what trade economists, well, Paul Krugman, when he was a trade economist, and everybody else have said, as you are further away from the others, you're going to trade less. So the coefficient on distance is negative. So, well, distance is impinging trade. This is, you know, Finding well, something else would be well, surprising. What's slightly well, surprising in Colombia is that distance has a smaller effect on trade flows than in Colombia. But trade flows, the internal trade flows in Colombia are incredibly low. And again, because we're only, to, we're only well, trading certain things, not very many things, whereas in the US, we're trading nearly everything well, across cities. And the third question for, so Colombia is a country that's already pretty highly urbanized. From the top of my head, I think the share of agriculture is about well, 20%. It's, it's a greater share of employment and a smaller share of GDP. The share of manufacturing is also about well, 20%. So it's a big service well, country. To some extent, Colombia is very highly urbanized, but this is due to the civil unrest where lots of people have been, uh, since the 1980s, displaced from rural areas and went into well, cities because they were kicked out, uh, well, kicked out one of those areas or they felt deeply unsafe in those areas. So believe it or not, the bad neighborhoods well, of Bogota, however bad well, they might be, they're way safer 
than some areas in the countryside where you had guerrilla groups, paramilitaries, and they were killing people for years and years on a grand scale. So people left with those places. So, so when I was saying that you have two or three million still to this day displaced with people in Colombia, that's because of that. So there was civil unrest on a grand scale, and people were afraid, and they were leaving. You know, you try to accommodate, you have the paramilitaries will coming in, you need to, well, if you don't want well to leave, you need to accommodate with those guys. And when the guerrilla is coming, you know you're a target, and vice versa. So you can never win. So people were leaving and went to the city. So well, Colombia urbanized a lot and urbanized well pretty early, I feel to some extent because of that problem. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, Kurt Silva from uh, the city. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions here, like one or three. Um, the first one is that uh, when you're running, you, you, you showed us a regression regarding the, the cost of living. Yeah, you basically uh, took, I think, uh, the proxy was uh, housing, housing costs. But I mean, wouldn't it have been uh, helpful if you'd uh, decided to look at uh, the average cost of living in, uh, in Colombia, in one of the cities, on, ha on average, how much does someone need to, to spend maybe for a month? not basically on housing, but uh, other things like transport and feeding that make, could actually determine how much actually someone could need to stay in a city like that. The other question is that urbanization comes with a fair amount of uh, pollution. But uh, throughout the, the presentation, I've not seen anything relating to pollution. And uh, the other issue is that um, you say that education is uh, very important. Yes, we all appreciate that it's very important. But uh, the other studies that mainly show that um, once you have uh, some of your credit markets failing, you could have highly skilled people, but they cannot have access to credit that is actually going to steer growth in a particular country. You've, uh, we've not seen anything to do with uh, uh, the credit markets. How are they in Colombia? Thank you. Okay, so lots of hard questions again. So, I'll, well, the first one, I think I have an answer. The other two is slightly, it's slightly, more, it's slightly more complicated. So, I've showed you some results about, the, about housing costs because I have that for 1,100 well, municipalities. I have reasonably good data for a ten year, five to five well, to 10 year well period. So, I think it's reasonably solid. I know for a much smaller group of places, i.e. the 20 largest well, cities or so, how much people spend on transportation, what share of their income they spend on transportation. So that's, it goes from 6% in small places to 10 or 11% of their income in Bogota. So this is something that is actually increasing a lot with city size. We have also some data on the cost of everything else. Again, it's a price index that's given to me uh, whenever I ask some details, nobody is able to tell me exactly how it was built. This price index is, is, is basically saying that there's no difference in the price of everything else. But what, what can we will conclude with, well, from that? It's really hard because first, for transportation, I know how much spend, well, how much will people spend in a small group of cities in terms of their income. I don't know what they can do with that. It's, so I don't know how much actually, how much with transportation they actually buy with that amount. I wish I knew that. That's why I'm complaining that, with that Colombia should have a transportation survey so that I would have the answer to that question. At the moment, I don't have the answer to that question. And for the price index, I have no idea whether they are actually well comparing likes with likes, i.e. the exact same good in different locations, or if they say, well, actually the price index is going to be rice, a kilo of rice. And a kilo of rice in a market, in a small town, that's going to be somebody, well, grabbing that, well, like this, probably some very low quality rice. Rice in Bogota, well, that might be well, coming from a high-end well, supermarket, imported from Thailand or from the US or God knows where. What those, price, what those price well differences really reflect, I don't know, because there's a huge well, quality issue which we don't know much about. So I've, I've concentrated on the housing part because I can at least well, control for the area of the houses. 
which is at least worth something. On everything else, I have worth some basic data, but there's only so much we know. Pollution, yes. We had actually one consultant working on pollution. It's a really big issue, but I need to start somewhere. I cannot do everything. And one of the problems for Colombia is that for institutional reasons, municipalities have the upper hand on environmental issues. There's no national set of indicators for, dif for pollution, for different things, for water quality, and so on and so forth. There's no national information about how much environmental stress well, there is in terms of, for instance, you know, like water can be of high quality or low quality, but you may have a lot of water to accommodate a much larger world population, or you may be already under stress, i.e. you have all your population, and if water well consumption will goes up, that will become very difficult. So what this consultant has done is to try to build that for something like 10 cities. But I cannot run regressions for 10 cities. And also, I know very little about environmental issues. I'm willing to teach myself with some of that because I think the, with the whole nexus, city and environment is really, really important. And as somebody who's actually lived in Bogota for a while, I was scratching my eyes every morning. It was red. After six months, I had blood in my nose every morning. So, and that was entirely due to the local pollution, which in some, well, in some of the cities is indeed really, really bad. So, I know there's been some work on that, but again, it's quite difficult. My comparative advantage is to be able to gather a lot of data and do that on pretty large well cross sections, sometimes well over time. Here, I just don't have enough data. Uh, credit markets, yes, but we, we need to put a, well, a perimeter to what we're doing. This is not the only project well, of public policy in Colombia, so they have working group on other things. Uh, we're doing cities. Uh, we cannot do everything, so we decided not to do that. We need to put, I mean, we face a trade-off between how much depth we're going to have and how much spread. And we, I think, we went already pretty wide. We, did, we explored lots and lots of different things. Uh, credit markets were not one of them. My name is Barry. Um, I'm a student at uh, CDE2. Uh, my question is maybe simple. It's just about to know how you did define an urban area, a city. Because and when I look at uh, the US Census Bureau, they call city an area which uh, population size is uh, above like 50,000 people. In my country, 10,000 people, even less can be called, area can be called a city. So I don't know if there is an international standard for defining it or if there is any framework. I just want to know what you call city. Thank you. So actually, Doing this, this exercise of constructing metropolitan areas for Colombia was interesting in several respects. Number one, this is an exercise that's not normally done by academics. It sounds a bit tedious, right? Built, look at commuting flows and, and try to define. It's a job that economists think are probably best done by accountants. Actually, this is wrong. So in the US, the official definition is actually coming, it's used by the Census Bureau, but it's actually coming from the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB. There's a document that I found fascinating about the latest well definition. It's a 15-page well document, like font six, actually signed by a very senior economist, case, case, well, case well sustain. I read the document. At the end of the document, I had no idea what they did really. In part because they will actually say, oh, we also took local opinions. So they did something that's pretty arbitrary. So what I tried to do for Colombia was actually to try to be systematic and have one criterion. But so here I was using, like many other countries, commuting flows across areas. 
So whenever some municipality sends more than X percent of its workforce to another one, you put them together. And then whenever there's yet another municipality that sends more than X, the same X percent of its workforce to the first set, you also aggregate it, and so on and so forth, and you keep aggregating with municipalities until you run out of places to aggregate, and you, and, and you get with your system. The threshold you choose is purely arbitrary. So for Colombia, we chose, te well, 10%, because we think this is capturing something, but, and I did some robustness checks, 5% or 20%, you don't get something that is widely different. So Bogota moves, for, for, for instance, from 23 municipalities to 26, which is no big deal because the three municipalities that get aggregated or not are pretty tiny anyway. So it doesn't make a huge world difference. But there's always an element of, uh, of, uh, of arbitrariness. And then what you want to call a metropolitan area, there's also you need to cut things at some population level. So for Colombia, we decided for most of what we do to use 100,000 well cut off. But again, this is completely arbitrary. This is completely arbitrary. The, well, the commuting well threshold across municipalities, you know, it will also depend on the size of municipalities. Big municipalities will have, will have a lot of their workforce working inside the municipality anyway. So Colombia, which has big municipalities, they're not going to send lots of people outside. Whereas if you look at France, which has 40,000 municipalities, like more than this country, France has lots of municipalities. They are tiny. In that case, for France, the French government is taking a threshold of 30%. Because those guys are so small that, yes, they tend, lots of workers tend to work in a different municipality. So you, you need to choose a number that makes sense. But this number is going to be somewhat arbitrary. And what you're going to call a metropolitan area, a city, you, you will need well, to define something again, which is going to be arbitrary. So if you were to actually well, define well, a city as being like 10,000 people or more, for a country like Japan, everybody would be living in a city. But yes, I understand that in your country, 10,000 people is already a pretty significant center of population, where you will have lots of important well, services and everything that are not available elsewhere. So there's also, those definitions are somewhat arbitrary and we need to be aware of the context. So it's perfectly fine for different countries to do well different things here. What I fear is that because very often with those definitions, there's some money attached. Even in this country, being a metropolitan area, you receive a little bit more from the federal government. As a result, people will lobby for that. And those definitions will become well politicized. So what I've done well for Colombia was to say, okay, this is the criterion, and I'm just applying it in a ruthless and completely mechanical way so that we get whatever we get. Actually, I think it makes a lot of sense, but I don't want well to start myself saying, okay, no, maybe those guys know, maybe those guys yes, or whatever. Actually, those guys, they don't show up in the data, but let's actually aggregate them. No, I don't want to do that. I think we should just do that in a clean way. Uh, but as far as I know, the exercise with, well, for Colombia, it's the only exercise where I'm putting my, t my numbers on the table, my code on the table, other countries, I have no idea what they do. Jim? Hi, I just have a model question, and you've probably thought about it uh, a lot, but just to clarify for this audience, uh, the intuition of a lot of... Uh, urban planners is that providing amenities draws a university educated population, yet you have both of them on the right side of your model. Uh, so what, what is the relation between these two, these two variables? So in this country, I think I know that places with universities or districts close to universities, they tend to provide nice amenities. There's lots of stuff for students. You will have more cultural stuff. And people tend to value that. And perhaps value that a lot. You know, people are willing to pay incredible amounts of money to live in San Francisco as opposed to places in the Midwest. They're willing to pay huge amounts of money. I, I was in London well, two weekends ago with Yanni a 2,000 square foot apartment in a nice part of London is worth 2 million pounds. 
In Philadelphia, for two million pounds, i.e. three million dollars, you can buy a pretty amazing house. So it means that people are willing to pay a lot to live in nice places. Especially because in London, people driving prices are not people who are actually working in London, they're just rich people from the world who want to live there. So I think amenities are hugely important. In Colombia, I could not find any evidence that they matter. I don't know why, maybe I have bad data, maybe I'm not running the, with the right regression, but I cannot find any evidence that amenities matter. Even worse, the only small results I got were supposedly nicer places which have like historical heritage and more museums per capita. They seem to be paying lower wages and have lower, have lower well, slightly well lower with property prices. But that's all I found, and I'm not willing to bet anything on that finding. Um, good evening, um, Mr. Gilles. Uh, my name is Parinha. I'm from uh, the CDE. I have three questions. Uh, first of all, um, in the model here, um, why is there no um, wage equalization uh, as um, urbanization uh, increases? That's the first question. Um, second question is um, why, uh, in the end, uh, you conclude that um, education, uh, you seem to stress on education and roads like too much. Um, I think that um, education is just like a signal uh, for um, the rural uh, people to move, to migrate to the cities. But this signal could be um, wrong because um, they may end up finding no jobs. So um, um, how about employment instead of education? Uh, why, why don't you like, focus on employment? Um, of course, uh, more educated people will move to the city, but chances are they might not get a job. Um, the, this is the second question. My third question is about the uh, duality in the labor market, that is a segmentation in the labor market. So 60% um, of the population uh, work in the informal sector. So how do you go about collecting data on wages in the informal sector? Because uh, mostly uh, these jobs uh, are not reported and they are difficult uh, to account for. Um, that's my last question. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, some really hard questions for late at night, but... Uh, so the last question, actually, yeah, that's a big issue. The way around this issue is not to use, like I did in France or people do in the US, is not to use labor market data, i.e. administrative well, well data where firms report on wages, because in that case, you'd be well capturing only indeed a small fraction of the population, is to use instead a household survey where large numbers of households are being surveyed and they're being asked about their income. So they're being asked about what's their income in all sorts of different ways, which is how many hours did you work last week? What was your income last week? How many hours do you regularly work on a typical week? What's your income on a typical week? And so on and so forth. So I think, you know, this may not be perfect, but this is the best we can do. Those households will survey are all really nice because they do go everywhere and try to survey people absolutely everywhere, legal or illegal, both in terms of labor market, but also in terms of housing market. So they, so they, don't, they also go to the slums, to the illegal settlements, and so on and so forth, and try to get some information. Wage equalization, I think it's, uh, you know, I have a labor supply curve here. Wage equalization means that you assume that this labor supply curve is flat. It may be flat or it may not be flat. I'm happy to have it upwards well, slo well sloping well like this or in a, in a concave way, I don't mind. Again, this is an empirical question. We want to be able to estimate that. So the way I've been dealing with that is to try to estimate an urban growth regression, i.e. how much more, how much bigger my city is 20 years later when the wage at the beginning of well, the period is higher how much adjustment there is. If there's full equalization, any will difference will, will should disappear right away. We don't see that in the data. 
even in the US, the adjustment process seems to be actually pretty slow. I mean, there's a debate about that. Some people say it's, it's fast. My own feeling is that what the adjustment will process is actually well pretty slow. And the elasticity over 20 years of population to wage well differences is not that high. You know, people say, oh, it's going to be one, two, three. Three is a high number. Well, if you think that there's wage equalization, you should find an infinite elasticity. Clearly, the data don't say that. But again, this is well open-minded. If this elasticity is really high, so be it. I just want to know. I don't want to impose right from the start what I view as an overly strong well condition. I know lots of my colleagues are doing that. They impose perfect well labor well mobility, and sometimes I do that in models as well because going into well, imperfect well, well mobility would be way too complicated. But for that sort of exercise, we need to keep an open mind and just try to estimate what goes on. Uh, education on roads, what I've learned with policymakers is that you need to hammer the same point over and over again, otherwise it doesn't go through. It's not because you said something really, really important once that it will actually go through, so you need to repeat it many, many times. So that's what I'm sort of doing here, I guess. Uh, that might be well, a bad habit, but at the same time, I feel that with policymakers, it's been very useful to do that. Whether education is a signal or not, uh, I think there's been, I mean, I'm not a specialist in that literature, but that's a long-standing question. I think it's been answered reasonably de well, decisively. I remember when I was a PhD student, indeed, I was like, yeah, why should people will study some more? Maybe it's just signaling. Since then, I think we've learned that there's probably something very real to education i.e. education is increasing the skills of people. When we try to measure the true returns to education in all sorts of ways, for instance, looking at legislations that force people to stay at school, whatever, until the age of 14 instead of the age of 12, until the age of 16 instead of, instead of the age of 14, we see that the people that were affected by those measures, they seem to be doing better on the labor market, so the returns to education seem to be very real. So I know academics will tend to overemphasize with education, but at the same time, I think with the data is actually at a broad level, will backing us and backing us will very strongly will on that point. Education matters. Education matters in developing countries. You know, we have here returns will to so will a college will premium, which is what something thirty will to forty percent. I.e., somebody who's been well to college relative to somebody who's not been to college in Colombia, it's at least twice as big. People who've been to college have much bigger earnings relative well to people who have not. So I think there's a big issue of education. What is slightly more complicated is education is not only a quantity but it's a quality. And in Colombia, the quality well, of public education is not that high. And, well, I suspect, I would like to know that, I suspect it varies a lot. Well, it varies well, a lot across space. A city like Bogota, which for where well, the public schools are not that great, is probably still lots better than rural areas where there's also education being provided, but which may be even worse. But I would like to know well, about that. So they've, so they've given me some data well, about education. Uh, at some stage, I'll try well, to open that and understand well, what this is and go back to Colombia and ask, well, and ask well, more questions and talk to people who have done well, that survey and try to understand what's going on exactly. But there's only so many things I can do. Uh, I also have a department well, to chair, a new class, some teaching going on, and so on and so forth. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, opportunities to ask questions in the future, you will be at the conference tomorrow. I want to thank you all for these wonderful questions and your participation. And please join me in thanking Gio for an interesting.